We began to look at this psalm last week, first of all by introducing it in its context in the Psalter. Psalm 1 introducing the whole of the book of Psalms, setting before us two kinds of people describing everyone in the world. We have the righteous, we have the wicked, we have those who are Christ's and those who are not. In Psalm 2 we note that there is a conflict between these two seed, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And it focuses upon God's messianic king. Why do the uh, heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? They set themselves in opposition against Christ. The Lord laughs and exalts him to his own right hand and builds his kingdom with the invitation to sinners to come and yet the warning that if they do not come, he will break them in pieces with a rod of iron. Two kinds of people in perpetual war. Psalm 3 teaches us how we as God's people are to cope in the midst of that conflict. And so we saw how the Christian is no stranger to trouble, but at the same time he is safe in the midst of that trouble. And that was our theme, the Christian's safety in times of trouble. Well, there are three sections to this psalm, each ending in your your Bible with the phrase, Selah or Selah. And you might wonder why when the minister reads the Psalms does he not read that word? Well I would simply say to you in response why when we sing the Psalms do we not sing that word? The reason is that it is a notation in Hebrew to mark a pause. It's a signpost. It's a, a a word to us to think upon what has just been said. So you'll find Selah at the end of verse 2, verse 4, and then verse 8. Three sections of the psalm. When the truth is declared, stop, think, and ponder it. The first section is verse 1 and verse 2, where a host of ever-increasing enemies were arraying themselves against David. And we spoke there of a rising tide of trouble. Absalom has revolted. David's own son. Ahithophel, his trusted counselor, has betrayed him. They've taken away the hearts of the men of Israel. A host of ever-increasing troubles. The second section is verse 3 and verse 4, where a cry is issued from the heart of King David, who knows that the Lord is for his defense. For example, verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Stop, think, learn. Well, we've looked at those first two sections. This morning we look at the final section, verse 5 through 8, where David shows us the spirit that you ought to have in times of trouble, together with what you you must ultimately learn from all of your trials in life. Let's consider in the first place, the Christian is calm in the midst of trouble. The Christian is calm in the midst of trouble. And the way David introduces that is in verse 5 by telling us, That he awakes one morning having enjoyed a good night's sleep. I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. Well that doesn't sound too profound in and of itself. But when you bring it into the context of trouble it's quite amazing. In the midst of these troubles David says I put my head on my pillow. I slept like a baby. Many things in life take sleep from our eyes. Sometimes it's physiological. You can have a medical condition which is disturbing peace. Sometimes there's just so much going on in your life. Your brain is like buzzing like a fridge. It just won't turn off. You can't stop thinking. You're not particularly stressed. You just can't shut down. But very often we have sleepless nights because of anxieties, because we are in the midst of trouble and fear. And try to bring that into David's life. Consider what's just happened to him. Everything was going well in the kingdom. There were troubles in his household. 
These have now spilled over into the kingdom where Absalom has rebelled against his own father and in a coup is trying to take the throne. David has had to run for his life out of the city of Jerusalem. He's in exile. There are few who are with him. He's left the city of God. He's crossing over the river Jordan. He's moving far and far, far, farther and farther away from the place of promise. And he says, I put my head upon my pillow and I slept. Have your children ever given you sleepless nights? Those of you with young children, they've given you sleepless nights because they cry and they want fed. Well, that's a a practical thing that you have to address. What I'm talking about is something worse than that. These little babies that cry and keep you awake are going to grow up and they're going to keep you awake for other reasons. Have you ever lost sleep over your children? Imagine your son rising up in your household, rebelling against your authority, not only in the house, but in your kingdom with a determination not just to run you out of town, but to kill you if necessary. David says, I lay down and slept. More than that, I woke because the Lord sustained me. Because the Lord preserved and kept me. Is that how you sleep? In the midst of trouble, do you know anything of the sleep of faith? You know, if we are functioning properly as Christians, we should sleep comfortably at all times. We should be calm in the midst of trouble because as you lay your body upon your bed, by faith you commit yourself, your soul, your circumstances and all of your concerns to God. And if faith is active the way it should be, we cast those burdens upon the Lord. And we let them go. Did you notice when we sang Psalm 4 that Psalm 3 is not the only place where David says this. This is something significant to him and therefore should be to us. Look at the end of Psalm 4 verse 8. He's back to it. He says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. He's talking about rebellion again. Verse 2. Why do the sons of men run after uh, vanity? Why is it they say of me? Who will show him any good? He says, well, they can say what they want. I'm going to put my head on the pillow. I'm going to sleep. Why? Because it is the Lord. Who preserves and keeps me. There's a sleep of presumption. You know I would say most people in the world. Sleep the sleep of presumption. They don't really think too deeply about anything. They just get up in the morning. They live a a godless life. They're not conscious of anything bigger or greater than them. They get to the end of the day. They fall into bed. And imagine that they're going to wake up okay the next day morning. It's a kind of careless, stupid sleep. Others can't sleep. What do they do? They turn to the bottle. Maybe the bottle will help me sleep. Maybe it will take away all my troubles or they they medicate. Not wrong in and of itself, but not our hope or confidence. There's a sleep of presumption. There's a sleep of mind numbing. But then there's a sleep of holy confidence that belongs to the trusting soul. The man who is calm in the midst of the storm, given by God and received through faith and prayer. I'll ask you again this morning, do you know anything of this tranquility of a well, biblically ordered and regulated mind, a mind that is not overwhelmed with all of the things that are going on around it, but a mind that is filled with the word and promise of God. 
Do you know anything of it? Well, you don't only need it for sleeping. You also need it for your waking hours in the midst of trouble. That you're not given to panic. This isn't the blind sleep of death and unbelief. This is a sleep, this is a faith that does not ignore reality. It faces up to reality, but it refuses to feed its fears. The focus is upon the Lord, and we rest upon God with reason. Imagine a a little boat in a harbor in the midst of a storm. And this boat doesn't have an anchor, children. What's going to happen to the boat? Whatever way the wind blows, whatever way the waves bash it, that little boat is going to follow. That's like the person in the midst of the storm who has no faith or hope. He's at uh, the, the mercy of the wind and of the waves. But now think of that little boat which has a firm anchor uh, uh, stuck upon a rock deep down under the surface. And now the same wind beats and the same waves beat against that boat. But what happens? It bobs about. The anchor strains. But the boat stays where it was. That's what we're talking about here. We're not telling ourselves there's no wind, there's no waves. We're not doing that. That's a a, a foolish presumption in the other way. We're facing up to the reality, but we're not feeding our fears. Why? Because we've got an anchor cast that's fastened to a rock. Now, it might be hard to sleep in that little boat. I grant you that. But imagine the fisherman. An old fisherman and a young fisherman. And they go out for three days to sea. And the storm begins to whip up upon the ocean. And the young fisherman, he gets into his bunk that night and he can't sleep for the life of him. And he looks over and this old fisherman is snoring his head off. And the young fisherman's thinking, how is that man sleeping when the boat's doing this? Well, you see, he was a young fisherman once and he didn't know how to sleep in the storm, but he learned through experience. He learned through experience to be able to do it. That's like the Christian, isn't it? When we're young, we're immature in the faith. The storm is swept up. We can't sleep. We can't focus for the life of ourselves. The Lord matures us in the faith. And there's that Christian is hope in God sleeping in the midst of a storm. It's the sleep of faith. But I'm also going to call it gospel sleep. Now, I don't really get too enthusiastic with this modern bent on sticking gospel to everything, you know, gospel before whatever. But it is valid to put it here. This is gospel sleep. Why do I say that? Because if you can sleep like this, you can die like this. If you can sleep like this, you can die like this. I will lay me down in sleep. And I will know that the Lord sustains me. Every night you put your head in the pillow, you don't know if you're going to wake up the next morning. Think of old Sisera in the Bible. There he was, he went into the tent and he put his head down to sleep. He didn't know Jael was going to drive a tent peg through his head that night. And who knows what went through his head that night as he went to sleep. He didn't know it was his last day upon this earth. Now I know that we can't live with that to the forefront of our minds every moment of every day. And I don't believe the Lord would have us live like that because it's kind of paralyzing. But the reality is true. Every night you put your head on the pillow, you have no guarantee that you're going to wake up the next day. Do you even think about it? But if if you even begin to think about that, as you lie upon your bed in the evening, you are immediately confronted with the gospel. Can I close my eyes in sleep 
as though I were closing my eyes in death, facing up to the reality that I might never open my eyes again in this world. This is the only way that it's safe for a sinner to sleep if his hope is in Christ. So as you go to bed this evening, ask yourself this question. If I die, where will I go? Where will I go? And if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're sleepless, you ask yourself this question. Can I not place my confidence in God? Suppose I were to die before the morning. Where is my hope? And you answer, my hope is in God. Okay, what's worse than death? What's worse than death? All these troubles that are taking sleep from your eyes, are they worse than death? No, death is the last and the great enemy. So you reconcile that in your heart and you say, well, if I were to die, my soul is safe. And you've answered the rest, haven't you? You've answered the rest because you're trusting in God. The Christian is calm in the midst of trouble. Secondly, the Christian is fearless in the face of his enemies. In addition to this statement of peaceful sleep, in verse 6, David says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. It's quite a statement. There he is. And he is utterly surrounded by enemies. And he says, I'm not going to fear. Do you know why? Because to follow on from what we said already, faith is a stranger to fear. It's unbelief that causes fear. But if we have faith in God, which is rooted in the fear of God, then that God-fearing faith will not fear anything in relation to its fear of God. Now, sometimes you are oppressed by enemies or, or circumstances. What do you do? You follow the path of unbelief into fear. You take your eye off God. You forget what God has said. You forget who God is. You're like the spies who went in to spy out the land of Canaan. And children, you remember how they came back to the tribes of Israel in the wilderness and they were carrying on their back the great big clusters of grapes of Eshcol. And people looked at these grapes and they said, we've never seen grapes the size of these. And the spies say, yeah, I know. You want to see the size of the guys who are growing them, but Giants. They followed the path of unbelief into fear. The story is told of one of the generals. I think he was an American general. And was it in the Korean War or something? Uh, And they were surrounded. And uh, his men were saying, you know, what are we going to do? And he looked all around him. And he said, great, they can't get away now. Very different take on the battle. That's like David here. If 10,000 surround me, if 10,000 surround me, I will not fear. He's walking by faith. How many times the word of God commands us to this? It says, fear not, fear not, fear not. God repeats it over and over again because... You're going to forget and fear. He constantly commands us not to fear. And then he gives us all of these wonderful examples like Psalm 3. David fleeing for his life in one sense, taking wise precautions. But he's not overwhelmed by fear. He's trusting in the Lord. Link what he says in verse 6 with what we read in verse 3. In verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. What has he said in verse 3? He said, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You're the one who surrounds me. Therefore, I don't care if ten thousand enemies surround me. 
because my defense is in God. He says the same thing in Psalm 27, verse 3. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. Why can he say that? Because of verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You're my light in darkness. You're my shield when all of mine enemies surround me. Therefore, he places his confidence in God. This is not some kind of foolish bravado that David is saying here. I don't care if I'm surrounded by enemies. He's not bragging, brethren. He's a broken man. He's leaving Jerusalem. Even when, he's, when Shimei starts heaping curses upon him, he keeps his mouth quiet. He's broken, humble in heart. But he believes God can deliver him. His hope is in God. You know the story of Stonewall Jackson. How he got that name. There's Jackson standing up there like a stone wall. Let's rally to him and we'll win. He picks up that name. Jackson said this. My faith teaches me to feel as safe in battle as I feel in bed. He wasn't ignoring the fact that there were bombs going off round about him, bullets flying. But he was aware that he was in the hand of God. And he prayed before every battle. He wasn't careless. It wasn't foolish. But don't you see the Christian has a fearless defiance. And it stirs up faith and enables Christian duty. Well, we see David is not presumptuous here. How do we see it? Remember in verse 4, he's crying unto God. Verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy help. But he doesn't tell us in verse 4 what he cried. He leaves that to verse 7. He cries, Arise, O Lord! Save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. He's saying, Lord, arise now. But arise now the way you have done in the past. He's stirring up his memory. This is what you've done for me in the past. Rise for my help again, Lord. When enemies surrounded me in the past, when they pursued me as wild beasts, I cried to you, what did you do? You smote them on the cheek. In other words, you broke their jaw. You broke their jaw and you shattered their teeth. They wanted to make a prey of me. And you rendered them impotent. You left them in a position that they could do no harm. They came after me like a lion and you broke their jaw. You, cr- you, 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 you broke their teeth so that the lion could not barely roar. And if it got close to me, all it could do would be lick and suck me. That's what you did for me, Lord. And now enemies have risen up against me again. And you can do the same thing. Arise, O Lord. Save me, my God. Can I bring that into your troubles this morning? What are the things that rise up against you? Well, as a Christian, you have many enemies. You have Satan, and he's a very real and powerful enemy. And he heads up legions of demons. So you are surrounded by 10,000 Enemies, you just can't see them. It's a daily reality. Then you have the men of the world. Psalm 1, the righteous and the wicked. What happens? Psalm 2, they're at war with each other. The men of the world who are given to the spirit of the age. And then within you, you have an enemy. You have an Absalom and a, and a, a Hithophel within you. You have indwelling sin that would spark a coup within your soul to overthrow your faith in God. And against all of those enemies, you must fight fearlessly. 
trusting in Christ. Well, verse 7 is relevant to you today because you can say of all these enemies what David says of his. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. What has Jesus Christ done with your adversary, the devil? He has crushed his head. He's crushed his head. And what has Christ done with the 10,000, the legions that Satan heads up? The Bible tells us he has reserved them in chains unto the judgment of the last day. (coughs) The lion may roar, but Christ has broken his jaw and taken all of his teeth out, so all that he can do is lick and suck. He cannot destroy one of God's true people. And what about men in this world? What can they do? They can only do what a sovereign saviour permits them to do. And it will only be for your good. And what about indwelling sin? What about the Absalom and the Ahithophel within? Christ has dealt with that as well. Romans chapter 6. Reckon yourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has definitively broken the power of sin in the life of a Christian. And the rest of our life is war, but it's a mopping up exercise. Oh, we have to fight it. But in principle and in power, the battle is won. Why then would we as believers fear? Can Satan overthrow a Christian? No. Therefore resist steadfast in the faith. Can the world overthrow a Christian? No. Because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Can indwelling sin ultimately overthrow a Christian? Well, it gets a little bit tricky here because if you yield to your lust, you'll prove in the end that you were never a Christian. But if you engage in the strength of Christ in the battle against indwelling sin, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul doesn't stop there in despair. It's a note of triumph. I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Will circumstance be able to overthrow you? Will death be able to overthrow you? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. O death, what is thy sting? O grave, what is thy victory? You start to get the point here. Christian can put his head down on his pillow at night and sleep. Why? Because the Lord is his God. The Christian can walk forth into the midst of trouble fearless and defiant. Why? Because Christ is his Savior and his King. And that brings us finally to the fact that the Christian's salvation is of the Lord. David has been building up to this climax and close through everything that he says. And in verse 8, he states it like this. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. He wants you as a believer to know that your salvation is absolutely sure. Because Jehovah is your saviour. But more than that, he wants you to understand that your only hope of salvation is in this same Jehovah. Salvation is, belongeth unto the Lord. Let me expand upon that. And it belongs to no one else. No one else. So if you do not have this salvation of the Lord, you're not saved. You shouldn't be able to sleep very well. And you've got every reason to fear the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is the only way 
of salvation. And so I press it upon your heart this morning. Salvation belongs to God alone. It is his purpose that planned it. It is his, is his power that accomplished it. And nothing that you do can ever earn or contribute to your salvation. You cannot save yourself. You must be saved. You must be saved. You're the man in the midst of the Atlantic Ocean who cannot swim. You've no hope. None. You need someone to rescue you. You need to be brought to an end of yourself to give up all hope of saving yourself. And you need this morning to go beyond hearing this for the thousandth time. You need to go beyond that to the point of owning up to your helplessness. Instead of walking around in continued pride and presumption, as if all will be okay, I tell you on God's behalf this morning, it won't. It won't. David teaches us, as he learned this lesson again, brought to the place where he has an empty hand. He can do nothing for himself. He can't save himself from 10,000 people. That's obvious. It's not going to happen. One man doesn't beat 10,000 people. But he's brought to that place where his hand is empty. And he says, it's all of God. <clears throat> Remember Jonah last week? He learned it, didn't he? He rebelled against the Lord and he ran on in sin. Where did his sin take him, children? Down, 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 down. And then he began to cry. He tells us two things in Jonah chapter 2. He tells us that he called or he prayed from the belly of the fish. But before that he says, I cried from the belly of hell. He was in the blackness of darkness. At the bottom of a watery grave. He had no hope whatsoever. Apart from the Lord. That's where you are in your sin. You rebel against God. Jonah's descent describes your life. Down, 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 down. And if not saved. Down into the blackness of darkness forever. I want to put you in that wheel's belly of helplessness and preach the gospel to you this morning. Salvation is of the Lord and of no one else. And when Jonah cried that, do you know what happened? The fish spat him out. From that place of death, he received life. Have you learned that today? Have you learned that you're utterly helpless? All you have is sin. That you're dependent upon the Lord for the very faith you need to believe in him. You're dependent upon the Lord for the very conviction of sin. You need to drive you to him. Helpless. Dead in trespasses and in sins. And perishing in your own helplessness. Out of the belly of your hell and sin. You need to cry this. Salvation is of the Lord. That it is only to be found in God's Son. Jesus Christ. But then God will place you as a Christian into circumstances. Just to remind you of this truth over and over and over again. And he does it here with David. A saved man, a believer. What does he do? He drives him into trouble. Jonah, after all, was a believer as well. Foolish believer. He ran on in sin. What did the Lord do to a backslidden believer? He put him into the depths of a watery blackness. That he might learn the lesson again that salvation is of God and of God alone. 
That without Jesus Christ you can do nothing. That all that you are is weakness. But accepting that is the beginning of your strength. Salvation is of the Lord. But then finally, not only is salvation belong to the Lord, but the benediction of God is upon his people. How sweet. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. The psalm ends the way we close every service. The blessing of God being pronounced over those who believe in him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. The communion of the Holy Ghost. Be upon you. Is upon you. The blessing of the high priest in the Old Testament. When they lifted up their voice and said to Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you his peace. God's blessing is upon his son Jesus Christ and therefore it is necessarily upon every believer who is found in Christ. But it doesn't always feel like that. Walk with David again. He leaves his palace. He walks out the city of Jerusalem. His son has revolted against him. He's wondering what is going on and what will the end of it be? He sends the Ark of the Covenant back. As he goes, Shimei curses him. And he says, let him curse. What he says is true. It's justified. This should be heaped upon me, a sinner. And yet as the curse of Shimei comes upon David, the blessing of God is upon him. Do you see that? The blessing of God is upon this man who's being despised and rejected and cursed. And as it was upon David, how much more was it upon David's son, our Lord Jesus? Despised, rejected, cursed by men. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you see that this morning? That though you walk in the midst of troubles, your troubles don't tell you that God is necessarily against you. They don't say to you, God has forgotten you. God is cursing you. They say to you as a believer, even in the midst of trouble, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost is upon you. Because if he blesses, he blesses, and nothing and no one can reverse it. Remember how the king of Moab tried to hire Balaam to curse Israel, and every time he tried, he failed. Rise up, Balaam. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. Or Balak and hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. This is the man, Balaam, who was hired to curse Israel. And he says, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. That the Lord hath seen no enchantment in Israel. The shout of the king is among him. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. The man who was hired to curse couldn't curse. He had to bless. So it is for Israel, the church of God, the blessing of Almighty God is upon them. But that is not true of you today who are found outside of Jesus Christ. The righteous and the wicked, Psalm 1. Those warring against Christ, Psalm 2. They're like the chaff the wind drives away. They're coming under the rod of iron and he's going to break them in pieces. He's going to crush them. Psalm 3 verse 8. He's going to break their jaw and smash their teeth and destroy them forever. David says, I lay down and slept because the Lord's my saviour. If you're not in Christ this morning, I pray that you don't sleep. 
I pray that God would rob sleep from your eyes and bring terror into your soul and present these images upon your heart because God's blessing is not upon you. Whatever you're interpreting from providence because you get a few things, nice things here or there in your life or things go well for God's blessing is not upon you. God's malediction, God's curse is upon you. And if you abuse the good things that God gives you by continuing in unbelief, then that curse, in a sense, intensifies. You need to be able to say this, salvation, my salvation, is of the Lord. God's blessing in Christ is upon me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Let's stand as we call upon him in prayer.